at the University of Laverne, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this one of the events that marks our 125th anniversary. I want to thank a few people, then I'll frame the panel, and then I'll introduce the panelists and we'll have questions uh, and conversation at the end. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who's a member of the 125th Anniversary Committee, as well as some board members who are present. I see Tony Revere, Bob Dyer, the committee, and any other board members here. No, we want to thank them for coming. And two people in particular that I want to thank, and I'm going to ask them to stand. And one of them is Julia Wheeler, who did so much of the logistical work on this. And also Sandra Wagner, who is really the driving force uh, behind organizing and pulling all of this together. Sandra. So today's event is in part a celebration of our past, in part it's an assessment of our present, and in part it's a commitment to our future if we envision that future to be guided by our core values. For those familiar with the Church of the Brethren story and core values, there's a clear coherence in the arc of the University of Laverne's history from tiny Lordsburg College in 1891 to one of the premier private comprehensive doctoral granting Hispanic serving institutions west of the Mississippi in 2017. The Church of the Brethren was founded in 1708 by a group of immigrants who had fled their homelands and sought refuge in a small German town of Schwarzenegg where they were both free from persecution and free to live according to their beliefs, which were rooted in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Later in the 18th century, the Brethren immigrated to Pennsylvania, where as a German minority, they often experienced Anglo-biased discrimination. In the late 19th century, a small group of these German Brethren Baptists, as they were then called, immigrated to California to work in the region's citrus orchards, and they eventually founded Lordsburg College in 1891. The Church of the Brethren strove to live up to two core beliefs. First, non-coercion of religion, that is to say, an openness and respect for individual conscience. And pacifism, rooted in a deep sense of egalitarianism, wherein others' lives are valued more than one's own. The brethren who came to California also shared a historical and existential ethos of frequent immigrations and common discrimination. Given these beliefs and ethos, it makes sense that the college would eventually neither require nor enforce that students, staff, or faculty be brethren to be in the community, or even to be Christian. And it makes sense that the Church of the Brethren in the 1950s would release control over the Board of Trustees. What's up for debate, in my mind, is was it natural demographic forces, or was it as a result of Brethren openness, that Laverne student body would come to reflect the demographics of the region, with nearly 50% Hispanic, some 10% African American, 10% Asian American, and close to half being the first in their families to earn a degree. And by the way, it's not lost on many of us here that so many of our current students, their parents or grandparents, came to California from across the United States, Mexico, Central America, and from abroad to flee a difficult life or to seek a better life in California. What's not up for debate, however, is that when the brethren, or when the university's values are lived out, that all students and all staff will find Laverne a welcome and affirming community free of discrimination. And what's not up for debate is that as a brethren-founded and federally designated Hispanic-serving institution, we will continue to affirm the right of all students, regardless of religion, ethnicity, 
or immigration status to be welcome and to remain safe in our community. The panelists who will guide us on an exploration of Brethren heritage, shared core values, and our HSI identity are Reverend Susan Boyer, Dr. David Hollinger, and Dr. Beatrice Gonzalez. After I introduce each of the panelists, they'll have around 10 minutes to provide their reflections. And then after the three have <coughs> spoken, um, we will then have an opportunity for conversation and comments and questions. Our first panelist is the Reverend Susan Boyer, who is the senior pastor at the Laverne Church of the Brethren and an alumna of the University of Laverne. She holds a Master's of Divinity from Bethany Theological Seminary and is one of the most intellectually engaged, engaging, humble, and provocative preachers that you will ever meet. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Reverend Susan Boyer. As Jonathan said, I pastor the local Church of the Brethren, the big concrete structure on the corner of Benita Avenue and East Street. Um, and I'm the only one up here without doctor in front of my name, so a little intimidated. Um, I've been asked to share with you the core values that make up the group that founded this college, this university. As I share, I may talk about the Brethren like they're an ethnic group because they began as an ethnic group. But what I'm trying to share with you is what has become the Brethren ethos. I've narrowed down this ethos just to five core main values. There are others. First one I want to talk about is openness, which Jonathan mentioned. The Church of the Brethren, originally called the German Baptist Brethren, began out of a strong conviction that the Reformation had not gone far enough. They felt strongly that baptism needed to be an adult decision, and they refused to say creeds and by their way of thinking make the Bible a fixed book. They believed that the Bible should be an open book and followers of Jesus should be reading it together, praying about it, and seeking new light in new times. They were persecuted for these beliefs. They began as the Church of the Brethren in Germany at a time when the understanding was that you were baptized as an infant and became a citizen at virtually the same time. They believed that God comes before, our faith in God comes before our allegiance to the state, and this belief made them very suspect as citizens. So some were jailed, some paid fines, and some actually ended up as galley slaves. The story of a people travels with it from generation <laughs> to generation, and so such is true in the Church of the Brethren. We understand ourselves as a peculiar people in the world. Persecution is part of our story, and so the brethren have held fast to the belief that we should have no creed but the entire New Testament, seeking ways to hear the Spirit of God speak new words to us in new times. So this openness to new light continues as a value of the Church of the Brethren today. We struggle, especially in this era of conservative and fundamentalism, but so far we have continued to reject creedalism. A second core value is work or service. The Laverne Church of the Brethren, where I pastor, was founded November 1st, 1890, with 27 charter members. And then this new church founded the Lordsburg Academy, which became the University of Laverne, and they did that in March of 1891. So they began a church and founded an academy within six months. The core value of the brethren is work. And my husband used to say, you brethren have a go button, but you have no stop button. <laughs> <laughs> the brethren are talkers. They're doers. Highly suspicious of anyone who comes off like a, they might be a salesperson. Several years ago, a church of the brethren the Church of the Brethren denomination decided that we needed a tagline, a way to explain ourselves to the world because we're so bad at that. But we non-talkers couldn't figure out how to describe ourselves, so we hired a marketing firm to do that work. And after months of interviewing Brethren, they came up with this tagline, continuing the work of Jesus peacefully, simply, together. And Brethren will tell you it's a good description. Our deepest core value 
is to continue the work that Jesus began. It isn't to sing his praises. It isn't to defend Jesus. It's to get busy and continue doing what he started. So we live off of that scripture that says that when we clothe the naked, when we feed the hungry, when we visit the prisoner, we will encounter Jesus in the people we meet. So brethren believe in good, honest, ethical service. It doesn't matter what you say. What matters is what you do. There's a story about a brethren farmer when asked what he believed. He said, go ask my wife, my children, my pastor, my boss, my neighbor. They'll tell you what I believe by how I live. Third core value is uh, respect of others. From its inception, the Church of the Brethren members have been people of peace. In the reading, praying, and discerning that the First Brethren did together, they came to the conclusion that they could participate, they could not participate in any form of violence. Brethren believe that everyone is our neighbor. <coughs> Many brethren have a bumper sticker on the back of their cars designed by a woman in our denomination that says, when Jesus said, love your enemies, I think he meant don't kill them. Many brethren have chosen not to participate in war, even when drafted. There have been consequences for that decision, but historically brethren have shown that they would rather suffer those consequences than harm another human being. This call to peacemaking has at its deepest level a respect of others, friend or foe, alike or different, known or unknown, everyone we meet is a child of God and our neighbor. Fourth core value is community. Rather than make decisions within a community framework, we don't have a hierarchy in our structure. The most important decisions are sent to our denominational annual conference, where each church sends delegates to represent them, and those delegates vote on polity, policy, and position. I'm the senior pastor of the Laverne Church of the Brethren, and there is only one place I get to vote in the whole structure. And that is at an all-church meeting where every member gets to vote. All voices are heard. All voices get a vote. We believe that the Spirit of God is heard when the community works and discerns together in love. And finally, number five, core value uh, five is we seem to be undaunted by change. We have a sociologist within the Church of the Brethren who's done extensive studies on the denomination. And one of his theses is that the most consistent thing about our denomination is its ability to adapt to change. It doesn't mean that we give up our core beliefs, but we do adapt to the world around us. And this fits in with our understanding um, that, that, that Scripture speaks to us with new light in new times. So. We've changed in several more ways than I can tell you about our understanding of the role of women, how we worship, how we dress, how we do the business of the church. We've changed our name a couple times, um, many things. So openness, service, respect of others, community, and change. I want to highlight those core values by sharing one example from our history. Dan West was a Church of the Brethren man who, had, um, who was a conscientious objector during World War I and then went to Spain during the Spanish Civil War and served as the director of a relief program that ladled out rations of milk to hungry children. And one day he thought to himself, these children don't need a cup of milk, they need a cow. So when he got home, he started talking to his neighbors and um, his brethren and friends with the idea of donating cows to the people of war-torn countries. He had a lot of friends who were farmers, because brethren had been agrarian people, and he figured they could donate a cow or two. They formed an organization called Heifers for Relief Committee, and in 1944, they sent their first shipment of 17 cows to Puerto Rico. Recipients of those heifers then promised that they would donate the first female calf to another family, and so forth and so forth. After World War II, men who were coming back from the war or who were serving in an alternative service as conscientious objectors 
became what was called seagoing cowboys, and they traveled with shiploads of animals to Europe, caring for the animals on the journey across the ocean. These animals were great relief to war-torn Europe. So with an eye on service and a respect for others, the Church of the Brethren came together as a community to see how they could be open to a new way of doing something that would allow for the empowerment of others. In 1953, Heifer Project became an independent program. Most people I meet have no idea the Church of the Brethren began that program. The Brethren released this program to become something bigger than it would have been if they had kept control of it. Heifer International is now a multi-million dollar nonprofit working hard to end world hunger. 125 years ago, a small group of brethren began something that has become this institution. Again, we released our control so that the university would become something bigger than it could have been if we held on to that control. As a brethren and as an alumna of this university, I am grateful for what it is and what it is becoming and for the core values of the brethren that still resonate. The panelist is Dr. David Hollinger, who is the Preston Hopkins Professor of History Emeritus at the University of California in Berkeley. Perhaps one of our most renowned graduates in terms of scholarship and research and acclaim, he is known for writings in American intellectual history and a prolific author, including recent books, quote, post-ethnic America beyond multiculturalism, and also, quote, after cloven tongues of fire, Protestant liberalism and modern American history. He's an alum of Laverne College, I should mention, and went on to mention, uh, to earn his master's and PhD at UC Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming him. Enough to take a walk around campus, which was uh, very interesting for me, because it's been some years since I had a chance to do that, and uh, I was uh, quite struck with how many things are named for people I knew. <laughs> I knew Frank and Nadine Johnson. I knew Dayton and Ada Faye Root. I knew Skip Monero. I knew Roland Ortmeier. I knew Harold Ruth Fosnott. I knew Jess Brandt. I even knew uh, Isaac Woody. I knew oodles and oodles of Han Waltz, <clears throat> and one other thing about that that I was struck, I don't know of any other institution, maybe some of you do, where so many buildings are named for coaches and custodians. <laughs> I thought this is a sign of the egalitarianism that uh, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about. Indeed, this brethren tradition of service and outreach that Susan has been talking about uh, really does make it uh, easy to welcome this transition <clears throat> from a predominantly brethren serving uh, institution to a predominantly Hispanic serving one. And it's a, it's a tradition, after all, that distinguished itself during World War II by standing firm when almost nobody else did with the Japanese Americans. And I'm glad to see that Ken Marcus is here because I know that Ken has been studying this episode and there are a number of holdings in the uh, University of Laverne archives about the, uh, about the brethren that were active in that. There were a number of brethren that went to San Pedro the day that the Japanese were, uh, were taken away and tried to stand down the looters and uh, were unsuccessful in doing that. And, uh, it, it's a, and all the way through the war, the brethren were conspicuous along with the Quakers in... <clears throat> trying to protect these Americans from the terrible uh, uh, disadvantage that they uh, were subject to. It's a tradition also of service that you find uh, with a scriptural warrant. Some of you are familiar with Galatians 3.28, that Christ there is no Jew nor uh, Greek, uh, no male or female, uh, no slave nor free. The brethren were never able to stop talking about the brotherhood of man. It was a, <clears throat> an idiom, a gender idiom that seems anachronistic today. But I heard it over and over again every day growing up. Indeed, the denomination itself was known as the Brotherhood when I was growing up. And I think that's a change uh, to the, now it's called the denomination. But all the references when I was growing up were to the Brotherhood. Um, but for me, this transition 
from a brethren serving institution to a Hispanic serving institution predominantly. I realize there are other things going on, but that's a, a very major transition. <coughs> That transition is, <clears throat> I think, easier for me personally than it might be for other members of the old tribe uh, because of a uh, family connection in that tradition that is uh, specifically was acted upon in relation to a disadvantaged Hispanic population. During World War II, um, uh, an uncle of mine spent five years working for the Brethren Service Commission, first in Puerto Rico and then in Falfurias, Texas. During the war, he was a conscientious objector. Susan was describing this tradition of the Brethren. And during World War II, <clears throat> the, uh, the Brethren and the Quakers and the Mennonites all established uh, what were called alternative service programs. So that instead of serving uh, uh, in the uh, Army or the Navy or whatever, uh, you would report to uh, these denominational boards and they would send you someplace to do socially productive work of one kind or another. And the Brethren had a huge apparatus at Castaner, uh, Puerto Rico, <clears throat> with a hospital and a school and a variety of agricultural uh, reform things. And my uncle uh, spent <clears throat> uh, the entire war there, and it marked him deeply. So much so that at the end of the war, he told Bob Ziegler, who will be known to some of you, a close family friend of ours, the head of the Brethren Service Commission, he told Bob that he would be willing to serve another year of alternates, uh, another year of service, no longer required by the government of your service, and if they could send him to some place where he could use his Spanish, he's very good at Spanish. So uh, Bob Ziegler sent him to Falfurious, Texas, where the Brethren had an agricultural <coughs> station <coughs> designed to uh, help the local uh, Hispanic farmers to develop better farming techniques and to deal with the um, often hostile uh, Anglo establishment in uh, Duval County, Texas. And I recently had occasion to read some of the letters that my uncle had written to my parents during those years, and he was uh, very struck with um, how the local merchants would brag to him about how easy it was to cheat the uh, local Hispanic families who did not have much education, but they would come into the stores and the, and the service providers of uh, Falfurius and others in, in New Wall County. This was uh, right near uh, Brownsville in the southern part of, uh, of, of Texas. My uncle's involvement was uh, with a philanthropic form of service operating in a hierarchy of power, which is always the case with philanthropy. But what we have here uh, and now is a very different situation. The Hispanic population served by this old Brethren College, now transformed, is not a recipient of charity. On the contrary, we now have an empowered population charting its own destiny, equipped to make its own choices, and ready to take over much of the leadership of an institution that was no longer functional in the specific context in which it was originally designed. This new relationship then is collegial rather than philanthropic. Now historians are acutely aware <coughs> that all human communities are contingent entities which are created, sustained, transformed, diminished, and sometimes disappear uh, depending on the circumstances of history. And the Brethren are like all other communities in that respect. The Brethren long predated the founding of Laverne College in 1891, and I have no doubt that the Brethren will survive the present historical moment. But the period between the 1890s and the 1960s was a special era for the Brethren, for this particular religiously defined community, because it was during those years that the Brethren had the largest numbers, built the most institutions, and participated the most vigorously in the leadership of American Protestantism. It was during those years that the Brethren were prominent leaders in church world service, uh, in international voluntary service, uh, in uh, the, the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches. It was during those years that they founded uh, these different colleges. And it was during those years that they established the Brethren Service Commission, uh, the Heifer Project, and some of the other things that we're talking about today. But since about 1970, the Brethren have declined in numbers and have occupied a much smaller place in the life of the nation and of ecumenical Protestantism than was the case earlier. This change was made has made necessary. This change has made necessary a reassessment of just what the brethren can do and where 
and in relation to what other communities. A college designed to serve the brethren population of the Pacific states found itself well before the end of the 20th century with a diminished constituency. Uh, one church after another in California, uh, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, uh, Western Canada, uh, simply folded, simply dried up. There, there weren't enough uh, uh, resources, enough people to keep them going. And this transition was even underway uh, when I was a student here between 1959 and 1963. Uh, at that time, it was sort of assumed by many of us that Laverne would eventually become a more or less standard post-Protestant uh, liberal arts college on the model of formerly Presbyterian Occidental, formerly Congregationalist Pomona, formerly Baptist Redlands, and formerly Quaker uh, Whittier. Not only were the brethren fewer in numbers, <clears throat> but many of the brethren children were sufficiently assimilated by that time to feel more comfortable than in earlier years going to other colleges, public or private. <clears throat> now, in this historical setting, which I've been describing, a disaster might well have occurred, but did not. Now, what I'm calling the disaster that did not happen was the turning over of Laverne to one of the politically conservative, wealthy constituencies that took possession of several other church-related colleges in Southern California. Now, this did happen to some of the colleges that were, like Laverne, uh, not sufficiently endowed with resources and space and other kinds of support to compete with Oxy, Pomona, Redlands, and Whittier as classic liberal arts colleges. But Laverne, realizing that it really was not going to become another Pomona college, did not go the rich Anglo-Republican route. Laverne ended up in partnership with an ethnically rather than a politically defined constituency, and one that had suffered discrimination rather than one that had enjoyed the benefits of Anglo privilege as had the rich conservatives that took over Chapman and Pepperdine. Now something like this almost happened at Laverne when Richard Nixon's friends were shopping around for a site for the Nixon Library. And some of you here will remember that there was a proposal that was actually presented to the Board of Trustees to try and uh, finalize the negotiations for this. But the trustee board, and at that time, the trustees really needed money. They desperately needed the money that the Nixon uh, billionaires were ready to provide, but they voted it down. Now, the ethnic history <clears throat> of the United States is a fascinating sequence of struggles in which groups once outside the mainstream find their way in. The Germans were once outsiders. Indeed, at the time of the American Revolution, prominent Anglos like Benjamin Franklin, in an episode that Susan referred to a while ago, um, and that Jonathan is uh, very aware of, um, the people at Anglos like Benjamin Franklin had contempt for all these Germans in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, they called them then the Dunkers because of this baptism thing. I mean, they were the, the, the brethren were very big on dunking people, trying with immersion. I mean, you had to be baptized in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 18, 29, if you haven't consulted your scripture recently. So this was something that they took very seriously. And the Anglos, people like Ben Franklin, thought these were a bunch of German rustics that could never be assimilated into American life. Now, it's unclear <clears throat> how long what we nowadays call the Hispanic population will remain in the category of a group that has specific needs. These things come and go in American history. The rate of outmarriage and cross-group uh, reproduction is extremely high in the case of Hispanics, as our demographers are reminding us all the time. And the Germans, after all, sort of disappeared, <clears throat> and it's a struggle to remember that until 1908, uh, the denomination, the Brotherhood, was known as the German Baptist Brethren. It's relatively recently that the overtly ethnic, avowedly ethnic character of this tribe uh, was no longer affirmed. But amid the contingencies of history, with each community coming and going like individual actors on a stage, some playing major roles and others simply marginal at the side, in the middle of all of this, one hopes that each group 
can find suitable partners along the way. No community makes it alone. And I, as a descendant of the old tribe, and the Hollingers were among the brethren who traveled from Germany to Pennsylvania long before the revolution, <clears throat> I'm glad that the brethren have found the right partners and the right successors for this institution. And I'd like to think that in commenting about this, I speak for my uncle, who served in Puerto Rico and fell furious. And I'd like to think that I speak for all the other Hollingers. And there were many of them. I was again reflecting while walking around the campus today. <clears throat> I've been connected. I mean, my father was a graduate here, a class of 1940. An uncle of mine, uh, not the one that served in Puerto Rico, but another uncle was a custodian here for about uh, 30 years. One of my aunts was the registrar of Laverne College all through the 1930s and 1940s. I had another aunt who was the uh, women's dormitory matron for a number of years. Uh, but beyond my own Laverne saturated family, uh, if I were, if I had the standing to speak for all the brethren, dead living and unborn, I would say to Devorah Lieberman and her current faculty and staff, we the old tribe are glad that you are now in charge. As well as Professor of Educational Counseling, a fellow of the American Council on Education, and an E. Kika de la Garza Fellow of the Department of Agriculture. She was recently honored as Woman of Distinction by State Assemblyman Chris Holden for the 41st District. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Beatrice. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to all of you for making time today. Um, you could be enjoying a beautiful walk today on this lovely day. Um, so it's hard to follow David. Um, I don't know any of the people whose names are on the buildings. <laughs> My family works here. Um, and I don't have that NPR voice that you have on the radio. You sound like on a radio or TV or something. Um, but I, I do want to say how honored I am as the new kid on the block to uh, be asked to serve on this panel with my fellow panelists and to speak about the mission and the history and the purpose of Laverne as we live it today. Um, so hopefully I can pick up a few strands that, that you've heard of and, and carry them forward in terms of what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution and to have this large Latino population that we have here at the University of Laverne. And I think that this dialogue will show that it's not only congruent with the Hispanic serving institution, it's not only congruent with our history and our mission and the founding values of this institution, but if I may anthropomorphize, uh, I think it is the self-actualization of the University of Laverne to be a Hispanic serving institution because of the values that we share, the Latino community, with the founders of the University of Laverne. Uh, David spoke about human communities being contingent. They're sustained or diminished, uh, and they're always transforming in one way or the other. And my understanding is that this university intentionally uh, took a direction towards this ethnic contingency, this uh, constituency, this Latino constituency. It was very purposeful. Yes. It was very purposeful about 20 turn years ago to two. specifically go over to uh, recruit in L.A. and to throw this Latino population here at the University of Laverne. Um, so while the population is growing around us, it was also an intentional act on the part of the University of Laverne uh, to have this large Latino population that we enjoy now. You also heard from the panelists about a uh, history of people who tore themselves from their homeland in search of liberty, dignity, and a sustainably peaceful existence. Well, that is true for many Latinos. Uh, the journey <coughs> archetype is highly relevant for Latinos, and David Diabolos, who writes a lot about Latinos and culture, Latino values, and I'm just going to quote here for a minute, the archetype of the journey has been central to the lives of Latinos. Our forebearers came to this country seeking a new life, a better life, at the cost of great personal suffering and risk. They left behind loved ones, a familiar land, and culture to journey into an unknown land with strange language and customs. But they came and they endured. So they have been witness to one of the oldest archetypes in humanity, uprooting, wandering, and creating a new life in a new land. And I'll offer that this journey is not just geographic, but it is also a journey of human development, of personal development, of growth for a better life, but not a better life just for oneself. The Latino story is making a better life for your family, for your community. Uh, uh, reach as we climb 
reach behind you as you climb up. You're, fi you're helping the people around you, the people who helped you. Uh, there is always a paying back, a giving back. And so I think it's very appropriate that we speak about the Latino character here at an institution of higher learning. Uh, I think it's a conversation that's also relevant because it's wise to pay attention to one's environment if one is seeking not merely to survive but to thrive. Uh, so what's going on around us with Latinos and why is it relevant to the University of Learn, not only because of our shared values but because of what's happening in the environment. So half of the students in K-12 education in California are Latino and a quarter of the students in K-12 education across the country are Latino. It's expected that in six years, by 2023, one in six Americans will be of Latino descent. And here at the University of Laverne, 40% of our students overall uh, claim to be of Latino descent, 48% of our undergraduates. 30% of our faculty and staff are Latino here at the University of Laverne. And so that's very relevant. It's, it's who we are. It's here, it's the water we swim in, it's in the air, it's, it's the leaves that fall from the trees. It's also important to know that 60% of all Latinos who go to college attend a Hispanic-serving institution like the University of Laverne. 60% of all Latinos attend a Hispanic-serving institution, and yet only 8% of higher ed institutions are HSIs. So as you see, Latinos are congregating at HSIs for a reason. Something feels good. Something feels like home. We're doing something that helps that population feel like they belong. So, so what is happening here at the University of Laverne and what are some of these cultural traits that, that resonate with the values of the University of Laverne and resonate with the values that Susan spoke about, openness, work and service, respect, community, and coping with change. Uh, so if you look at uh, literature out on Latinos, you can um, find some common characteristics of Latinos and you might, when you hear some of these, you might say, well, wait a minute, my cultural background also has some of those things. Yes, as human beings, we share a lot of similarities. Uh, these are not exclusive only to Latinos, but these are some common characteristics of Latinos. Um, I should say a couple more things before I talk about how Latinos are. Um, so, uh, that's a, right, that would be a big mistake to say this is the way all Latinos are. And if you're not Latino, if you walk out the store and say, you're Latino, here's what I heard about you today, and here's how you are. Um, Latinos come from over 30 different countries. They speak five different European languages. They speak native dialects, indigenous dialects. They have regional uh, dialects of so Spanish, depending on what countries or what areas of countries they're from. They have unique histories of immigration. For example, for Mexican Americans, they might say America came to them. They didn't go to America, right? They were here first. So um, all of these differences make uh, a Latino very different from one another. So, and Latinos would rarely speak of themselves as, I'm Latino or I'm Hispanic. They'd say I'm Cuban or I'm Mexican or I'm Salvadorian. They'd speak of their country of origin, not this big group. It's, it's the way we call ourselves to speak to the other structures, to speak to government, to speak to education, to speak to, to social entities. So it's a way to organize. Uh, and it's a way to come together for um, uh, helping others understand us, for um, the buying of resources, that, that sort of thing. But um, I don't think many Latinos would say, I'm, I'm Latino. Uh, so one is that. There, there may not be a common site, yes. There are people who come from so many different countries who say that they are Latino. Uh, and one would have to identify with that first, even though that may be true, that set of characteristics. I would then have to identify with that set of characteristics. So that's one. One caution, all these different people aren't necessarily all the same. And then the other um, thing before I talk about what Latinos are like is to say that, I have to say it because I'm a counselor, that within group differences are bigger than between group differences. Oh, what does that mean? Ugh. Well, what that means is that, um, so you have different categories of people. There are men, there are women, and somebody might say, oh, Susan and I have a lot in common. We're women and we're different than men, than that other group of men. And we can say how men and women are different from each other. But then if you look within those groups, Susan and I are probably super different from each other. We're more different than each other than we are uh, different than men. Mm -hmm. So just keeping that idea of between within group differences being um, bigger than within group differences. All right, that's enough for my commercials. Now, how, how are uh, Latinos similar to each other? I think, uh, generally speaking, the idea of tradition, which I think at a university that's 120 
25 years old, the idea of paying attention to tradition, respecting tradition, uh, there's, a, there's a certain simpatico there. We, we get, I think, Latinos um, traditionally pay attention to, to God, family, and hard work. Those are three main core values. And then there's a reverence for the past, not so much looking towards the past to, to guide the future, but rather looking towards the past in terms of remember your history, remember who you are, where you came from, know who your elders are, and respect those elders. So this sense of tradition and history and, and things that are solid and never go away, like God, family, and work. Um, in terms of special, specific traits that resonate with the values I, I heard today, I think there's one of risk-taking. Often Latinos in this country have a history that is all about taking a risk to be here, um, taking some path that might have been dangerous, it might have been uh, lonely because maybe half of your family or most of your family didn't come with you. Um, the unknown, uh, how many times did I hear the story of um, my family, my parents coming to this country with nothing in their pockets. And my mother always coming to tears when she told the story of one great aunt who, when we arrived in New York and came from Cuba, there were, we didn't have warm clothes, but my mother crying when she told the story of coming to my great aunt's house and she had laid on the bed two full sets of winter outfits for me and my sister, so gloves and shoes and stockings and boots and a scarf, and it meant the world to her. And we knew we had that extended family. Um, waiting for us. We didn't know what they had, but we knew that they were going to take care of us. It was going to be okay. We took the risk because we knew other people would be there for us. Um, hard work, um, the idea of honest work, that as long as it's honest work, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you are a professor or a doctor or you're cleaning someone's house uh, or you're um, taking care of someone's child. If it is honest work, it's good work and you're never ashamed of it. Um, you're also never ashamed of having more than one job because the, the main point is to provide for your family. You take care of the people who took care of you. Um, that sense of reciprocity is very big. So that, that takes me to uh, familismo, which is that idea of interdependence. I think one of the things that might be the, the biggest um, shock in terms of American culture for Latino families is this interdependence within the family. And I know when um, I worked as a high school guidance counselor, I know my fellow guidance counselors were always, um, oh, so vexed and, and so upset because they couldn't get the students to go away to school. The, the students wanted to stay home near their families. Uh, and they saw that as a limitation for the students. That, oh, no, they're not going away to school. They're not going to have that experience. And indeed, going away to school is, is a great experience, but it's also a great experience to be around your house when your grandmother's dying so you can feed her, so you can help do that. It's also a great experience that when your dad needs extra help on the job, you can make those calls for him. That's a great experience, and there's great reward there. So I think of looking at um, our Latino families as, um, as having great value in terms of that interdependence, not something that is less than, oh, you didn't have this experience of going away. No, but I had this experience of helping hold my family together, helping my family earn a living, helping my family um, transition one of the elders. All of that is, is of great values and I think brings um, great character to people. Um, uh, and I spent on the idea of respecting other people um, and not being in people's face and not being, um, you can be in someone's face, uh, but you start it off with a conversation first and you start off respectful and you start with a relationship. So it's not that it's not, you don't confront, but you first establish the relationship. So that brings me to personalismo, which is that idea of formal friendliness. Um, Latinos place a high value on interpersonal relationships, on the personal. Um, they're very sensitive to people's feelings. So again, even though you might be negotiating something in business, um, a Latino will typically approach it in a friendly way, um, that we have to be on good personal terms. Um, it's an orientation for people instead of status, for people instead of material goods, for people instead of um, institutional relationships. So that familiar, the personal, the idea of interdependence, helping each other, we both win, if we help each other, I'm going to be here for you, loyalty, um, respecting the elders, hard work, um, all of these I think resonate a lot with the um, brethren values. And as I look at, Susan talked about the doing, you know, we're doers, the brethren are doers, um, not philosophizers, maybe they philosophize also, but then there's the doing part. And I, and I was thinking here at the University of Laverne, what have we done, what are we doing? 
that shows that we are doing this work on behalf of our Latino students and all our students. How are we serving, Spanish serving institution, how are we serving our Latino students? And I thought of a few things that I think do match the culture and perhaps are part of the reasons why our students do choose to come here to this Hispanic serving institution. So one, I think, is, is a conversation like this today, an intentional exploration of who we are as a Hispanic serving institution. What does it mean uh, to serve Latino students, not just enroll them? And we have been having this very intentional conversation for two years now. We're not letting it be something that happens by accident. Or that may not happen because we're not intentional about it. We've done that at Provost Council, on retreats, at the President's State of the University address, addresses. She has addressed what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution. We've had student forums and focus groups on this topic. So I think this idea of really paying attention, what does it mean? Trying to ask that question and figuring it out. And that's going to be a different answer for every Hispanic serving institution. I think secondly, our educational practices and our institutional practices resonate with our Latino students. Um, I think the idea of learning communities, so that's a small group of people coming together and, and sharing an intimacy and that is very important for Latino students and Latino people in general. Undergraduate research, that idea of having a mentor, someone I respect, who's paying attention to me, that I'm in this intimate relationship with uh, an elder, a guide, so that undergraduate research super important and resonates with Latino families and students. Uh, the bilingual outreach that we've done, language, I've said 30 different countries, all these different languages, but one thing that sort of ties Latinos together is the Spanish language and, and the di desire to speak it with each other and that it, it is hanging on in our family. So bilingual outreach and financial aid and orientation and SOAR. I finally I'd like to talk about um, ROC and CAPA in terms of our Latino uh, ethnic, our ethos. Um, if you know Latino fans, we talked about that, helping each other. Um, you sacrifice the individual for the family because the family sacrificed for you to get you wherever you are. And so often Latino students will stop out. They're not going to drop out, but they're going to stop out. It could be six months, could be a year, could be two years, could be three years. Maybe I was helping a sick person, maybe I was helping raise my little brother, maybe I'm helping get the, the business back on the track. And our Rock and Kappa, or um, part of the University of Laverne, helps students hop back in and out. And it's less expensive, and it's in the evening, so after taking care of my family, I can go take my classes. And it's close to home, I don't have to go that far away to take my classes. So I think it really speaks to um, who Latinos are and what they need in order to meet their family responsibilities. Um, and I guess finally, uh, is the, what we've done in, to strengthen our institution by um, seeking uh, federal grants that help us make the infrastructure of this university a little stronger, whether it be in our sponsored research program or tutoring or um, mentorship programs. So we've availed ourselves of funding that's available to us, even though going for those funds is actually a lot of work and sometimes it's very taxing on the system because we don't necessarily have all the, the different gears going that need to be going to handle a $6 million grant at any given moment. But we do it because we know it's going to make us a better institution for our Latino students. Um, I have some thoughts on next steps, but maybe that's, that's up to our panel leader to take us to the next point in our dialogue. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Beatrice. Thank you all to the panelists for a wonderful presentation. It's really fascinating. I have two questions. Um, yeah. Stand up. Oh. And we're going to grab a microphone. One, give us one second. I have two questions. One, uh, I've heard the brethren uh, involved in a lot of different things, but I've never heard of uh, the galley slaves. Uh, how it's a process, and we could uh, uh, further that, uh, tell us about that. But more seriously, uh, both. Um, uh, David B. just referred to uh, uh, the current political climate. And that, I think David, your comment about the brethren who would be able to undoubtedly survive the current political climate and that effect. I wasn't thinking of that so much as diminished numbers, but go ahead, Ken. I'd be excited to hear what you're saying. I've been in the work for 15 years, and there's no doubt in my mind that the current political climate, the, you know, the administration, is, uh, represents a direct um, attack, in my view, on the values and mission of this university. And that includes specifically attacks against uh, Latinos, against Mexico, against 
the personalismo that uh, Bader is referred to. And so my question is, one, uh, under this notion of work uh, for the president, what steps, if any, should the administration, uh, should, should Laverne take against this seeming affront? Or perhaps we should not get political at all, should simply avoid the current political climate and focus instead on more community health issues. I don't think I'm the right person to speak to that. Uh, uh, I would just say that a lot of institutions nationally that have not already made the step to being Hispanic and serving are perhaps under a greater obligation to do something about this. So there are uh, many campuses. I mean, my uh, campus at Berkeley is one of the examples. Is putting out statements all the time, and there's all this thing about sanctuaries and. I know a number of people around Berkeley that are uh, <coughs> volunteering to uh, help undocumented families uh, to get social protection and uh, legal advice. So these are things that go on in, uh, in most university and college communities. From the outside, it would seem to me that Laverne is a little bit different because you're already doing so much. now. But I have to say that I haven't thought about that from the point of view of Laverne, and there may be things that Laverne in particular could do, and I think my friends up here are more qualified to address that as a policy matter here. I would say that while it's true that it's very important for those, um, the haves, the people, with the, the Berkeleys with more resources and more voice, um, to make statements that are supportive of places like the University of Laverne where we maybe have a smaller voice or smaller presence because of the resources we have. I think it is important for the University of Laverne to own its mission, to own its history, and um, if supporting um, uh, immigrants to the United States is part of that, given how the university was founded, I think we should continue on that path. Now, is it a tricky um, a road, yeah, it's a tricky road because we do have um, donors and we have board members who perhaps don't have the same feelings um, that some of us on this panel, like I myself, have about um, what should be happening in terms of um, DACA students or undocumented students here at the University of Laverne and what um, kind of positions we should take. But that's why it's important to have a conversation like this where we revisit our shared history and our shared values because we do have a partner across the street and maybe the things that we can't do completely on our own, we can do in partnership with the Church of the Brethren. Um, it's, you know, like bird formations, you know, when the one in front gets tied, you know, or can't do it, the one goes back and then someone else is in charge. And so I think that kind of partnership um, is important so that we can meet our mission even today, even when it's a little prickly and a little difficult to do so. You know, Ken, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. I hope today's panel answers in some way that the entire thrust of the Brethren core values in the history of the Brethren and the university by implication means as we move forward, we need to be supportive of immigrants, be open to immigrants in any way and in every way. Now, how you translate that into political action by a university is, I think, the, the, tricky, uh, or the trickier question. I think that's one that's where we've had an awful lot of debate. But which side should the university be on? <coughs> Absolutely clear. Other, other questions? Yeah, plus yeah. I'm, I'm proud to be here. And um, I'm proud to learn of the history of the brethren, of doing the right thing, even when times are tough. Not just a little tricky, but when times are real tough. Um, I think one of the things that the university can do is keep its doors open, even at times when that's hard. Um, I, uh, uh, as I hear you talk, I'm reminded of um, the Reverend King's um, sermon about the knock at midnight. Um, it was given at the uh, height of the civil rights movement and he chastised the black church for not answering the knock at midnight, which is the most dangerous, most dangerous time of the day. 
Um, and he also encouraged them to, when they do answer the door, to have fresh bread all the time. Um, so that's what I would like to see the university uh, do, keep its doors open uh, and have uh, fresh bread for the, for the communities that uh, are not even, even at the moment. I think, Dad, I think one of the most important things we do and have been doing in the last couple of years is helping our students um, gain empowerment. I, I notice a difference, I've been here three and a half years from when I came to now, I think our students are more aware of their power, they're more aware of how to work through a system, I think we are empowering them by educating them on those terms, um, and, I, and I think that's a very important thing to do, help our students organize, help our students learn how to uh, work through a system that sometimes is uninviting or um, even discouraging. And I, I, I sense that a greater sense of activism on campus than um, certainly than it was three years ago when I first came. We have a question from the uh, Bakersfield or Kern County campus for Susan Boyer. Please speak to the relationships, if any, of the Church of the Brethren in Kern County as they relate to the University of Laverne. We have a few in our region. Are they asking if there are Church of the Brethren in that? No, that we have a few. So we have the Bakersfield Church of the Brethren, the McFarland, Modesto. Are they asking if the core values are... I, I don't understand. Yeah, I'm... Um, so, Nora, if you can hear this, probably speak that again. Please speak to the relationships, if any, of the Church of the Brethren in the Kern County as they relate to the University of Laverne. This is being broadcast worldwide and people are tweeting in. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till tomorrow. I think morning. they want to know how the churches up there are related, if at all, to the university. Oh, okay. We have we do have um, we do have churches of the brethren in the Central Valley. Uh, and the Church of the Brethren here locally began the university, but that there was this sense of, of the whole Church of the Brethren being um, um, connected and uh, influencing the, the university all together. The Brethren look very different uh, in different locations because we have no creed but the New Testament. And so we don't tell people, you have to believe it like this. So we have quite a continuum of brethren um, understanding because because of that uh, egalitarian understanding and everyone having a voice. So we look different in different places, but um, brethren exist in California and across the country. I think we have time for a couple more questions. The question I have is intentionality with the HSI. Uh, Beatrice said that she understood this to be an intentional movement. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, all the oral histories that I've done, the only person who's ever mentioned it was Adeline, who was hired to try to uh, reach out to that community. I think it was accidental, but it's no longer accidental. And so, uh, unlike so much of the rest of our history and all those changes that were referred to, it seems to me that we need some kind of a, an intentionality with the HSI in the future. And I know you're working on that. I'm just curious to know, uh, to hear some of what it is. So we did about two or three years ago, we started at the Provost Council, a one to two year long focus on having a conversation with senior administrators on, in academic and student affairs on what does it mean to be an HSI with a focus on the survey. So we've had periodic uh, provost retreats where we focused on that theme and had that intentional discussion. We've also at the same time, and I think Beatrice should talk more about this, had focus sessions with our students, listening to students about what it means to them and what are their needs. And so we do have kind of a, a, um, a sketch of what kind of programs do we need to think of, what do some of the places need to look like in terms of the, the campus, um, what about people in terms of training, cultural competence, and, and hiring uh, more diverse uh, faculty? So the, some of those initiatives have been ongoing. 
um, are when we social students and ask them, what do you need to feel like you belong here? Because if you feel like you belong, you'll, you'll probably stay. And they came down in the category of people, places, programs, and policies. And so in terms of people Jonathan mentioned, they want to see more diverse faculty and staff. And so we've started a training program um, recruiting and hiring teacher scholars for mission. And so it's a two and a half hour training program. And if you're going to sit on a faculty search committee, you have to go to that training. It's going to be uh, cloned for, for staff hiring for our population. Um, students, so that's just an example of people programs. They want um, programs uh, that resonate with them and that will be relevant to them in the world that they're going to be a part of. So they want ethnic studies, they want Latino studies, they want gender studies. They realize that their life, their being is intersectional and it's part culture and part it's race, ethnicity, sexuality, it's all of those pieces and they want to learn more about that. They know they will be a more uh, fluent person in the world if they know about those things. And so we are um, not only starting those programs, we're also working towards a required course in leadership and culture here at the University of Vermont that will be required for all um, first year students. Uh, in terms of places, students, even though we have beautiful art, the students felt that the art did not reflect them. Uh, or the different populations here at the University of Learn. So we've started an arts council. Students comprise about a third of the arts council, so their voices is prominent on the Arts Council. And um, we've started work, we've already um, hired an artist, Christy Sandoval, who's going to start working on murals on the side of the library. So instead of Trump Lloyd windows, we're going to have murals that reflect our history and the culture and, and who's here at the University of Bern. Um, uh, let's see what else. Um, financial aid policy. So they want us to look at policies for financial aid. They want us to look at graduate school mentorship. You know, why aren't we giving our students more a mentorship on that, they're often the first in their families to go to school, so they really don't know the ropes about how you get in grad school, and once I get there, what do I do? How do I hook up with a, a mentor, a faculty member, uh, who's going to help me all along the way? So um, we've really, it's the kind of thing where, you know, we've talked before about cooking on all burners. You know, we have to do the people part, we have to do the program part, we have to do the, the environment part. All of it has to be going and responsive to our students if, if we want them to have a good experience here, not just to our students, to our faculty and staff who also are seeking that diversity. And Al, I'm wondering, since you brought it up, if Adeline, you would not mind commenting on your role in, in really helping us accelerate the process of becoming an HSO. I came, I came uh, to Laverne as we were transitioning from, one, from newcomer to Serafian. And so it was very intentional. Serafian's vision was to diversify the student body because it was at a demographic low. And uh, being from a community college, Pasadena City College, I believe is where he came from, he, he was working with a very different demographic than existed here on the campus. And so I was brought in. And it wasn't just a matter of recruiting, but of shaping and identifying the, 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 the characteristics of the student body that would be able to afford to come to Laverne. So at that time we were looking at uh, Cal, Cal Grant eligible students and Pell Grant eligible students because those two programs combined with a certain GPA equaled our tuition and so students could then afford it. So I think there was maybe a, a little more shaping and intentionality uh, internally among the, among the offices that were working on it than maybe the entire institution knew about. Thank you. One comment I'd like to make, just to <coughs> add that I think it's helpful to always remember that part of the educational uh, mission is to help students uh, to get to some place that they're not already. And <clears throat> much as we appreciate and want to honor and uh, empower the culture of the family and the culture of the peer group that comes in, uh, part of a, a university's obligation to students is to help them to become something other than what they already are. And it was very important uh, during the Brethren era that Laverne College help people become something other than Brethren. And I think this is a general point throughout the educational process and <clears throat> represents an interesting challenge which 
uh, is constructed differently from situation to situation. Absolutely, you have to attend to the uh, concerns and the uh, structural situation that Beatrice has described. Uh, but there's always a, a danger that one will end up uh, uh, reinforcing parochialism <coughs> rather than empowering people to have broader experiences. And so that's tension between you know, what's provincial and what's family on the one hand and the larger world, uh, which if we don't understand uh, more of it, will um, uh, come back and hit us. Well, it is after 1 o'clock. We do want to honor our time. If you do have any additional questions or would like to have a conversation with our panelists, we ask you to please come up here. Now, however, let's please thank all of our panelists.